So in this video we're covering chapter 5, section 2, which is electron configuration and the periodic table. Now as I mentioned in the last chapter, uh, when they laid out the periodic table, uh, scientists found some extra elements later on that were very hard to categorize, and this was because they were highly unreactive. And they are a group over here known as the noble gases. And the noble gases are unreactive because they follow something called the octet rule completely, which is where your entire outer uh, shell of electrons is full. And what you'll find is that this outer shell of electrons, often called the valence electrons, is what determines an element's chemical properties. So as I mentioned in my last video, uh, the table is arranged so that you periodically come across elements of the same properties. And these elements with common properties are put into columns called groups. For example, this is group 1, and over here you have group 18. And what this means is that the vertical elements in each of these share uh, various properties. However, it's also arranged horizontally into what are known as periods. Now the length of each of these periods shows the number of electrons that can occupy various sublevels within this period. For example, the first period, which contains only hydrogen and helium, has two elements in it. Therefore, it can only hold two electrons, in this case in the 1s uh, sublevel. Now, if you look at the next one down, it has eight elements in it, and that's because it contains the sublevels 2s and 2p, which, as we learned previously, the s orbital sublevel can hold two electrons and the p can hold six. Now, if you move further down, you'll notice that this has ten more in the middle, which means that in total this period can hold 18, and so on and so forth. You get down to the 6th and 7th periods when you add 14 more with the lanthanides and actinides, and you get that period with all its sublevels included can hold up to 32 uh, electron arrangements, meaning 32 different elements. An element's electron configuration also gives its period and location on the table. For example, let's take, say, uh, element 33, arsenic. Now arsenic, if we use the noble gas notation, has the electron configuration argon 3d10 4s 24p3. Now as you'll notice, the highest energy level that argon has electrons in is the fourth, and non-coincidentally, uh, it is in the fourth period. Now you'll also notice that the uh, highest sublevel that electrons and argon occupy is the P sublevel, right here. And that is the same for all of these elements in what is known as the P block. Now this is common practice. The table is divided into a few what are known as sort of sub-blocks of the table. Now I'll start over here. First this is the P block, and then you, if you come back over here to the alkali metals and the alkali earth metals, they form what is known as the S block, along with uh, hydrogen and helium, which as we know have 1s1 and 2, which is why they're in the S block, because their highest sub-level is S. Then in the middle we have the D block, these are a bunch of transition metals, which we'll study later. And then finally down at the bottom, the lanthanides and actinides form the F block. And these blocks all derive their name based on which sublevel is being filled uh, at that point for these elements. So now we'll take a closer look at the S block elements. Now the X, X block elements are the elements from group 1 and group 2 which tend to be uh, highly reactive metals. Now their electron configurations are ns1 and ns2 respectively, where n is the energy level, because obviously they're not all in the same energy level, that's why they're in different periods. Now the ease which with, with which uh, 
the group one elements lose this one electron right here is what makes them highly reactive. Group two also is highly reactive because it's pretty easy to lose these two electrons as well. Uh, now they have special names. Group one is called the alkali metals and group two very similarly is called the alkaline earth metals. Now although hydrogen and helium follow these two configurations of NS1 and NS2 with one with the first energy level they're not usually included in like the main S block with the alkaline metals and the alkaline earth metals because they're very chemically different they aren't as reactive so they don't have to be stored under oil like these do to avoid uh, explosive reactivity so now we're going to be looking at the D block elements which form groups 3 through 12 and if you'll remember from our rules earlier for each energy level N which is uh, one of our quantum numbers, uh, then there are n sublevels. So what that means is that once you get down to the third energy level, you now have sublevels S, P, and D. You have three of them. Now, you may be saying to yourself, okay, so why in the third period, if that corresponds to the energy level, aren't there a block of D group elements? And that is because the D sublevel actually is a slightly higher energy than the S sublevel of the next energy level. So what I'm saying is that if the 4S energy level uses, say, this much energy, then the 3D is slightly up. And if we follow our diagonal lines, as we did earlier, you see that you have to fill up the lower energy 4S uh, level before you fill up the 3D. So the D sublevel has a total of five orbitals which can hold up to two electrons each. If you'll remember you can have up to two electrons in each of these sublevels. So the grand total of electron arrangements in the D sublevel comes out to 10 which is why there are 10 elements here in the D block across. Now because of the weird energy states where 4s is lower energy than 3d the formula notation for D block elements is a bit strange. So if we were to take uh, scandium for example, its electron configuration would be argon uh, 3D1 4S2 because you still go in order of ascending energy level despite the fact that the 4S orbital is slightly lower energy than the 3D. But This means that the formula generally is n minus 1, where n is the period or highest energy level, d however many, so dx, uh, 4, or sorry, n, s, 2. So basically what this means is that you take the energy level you're at and fill up that s orbital first, and then what you'll do is you fill up the d orbital with however many across you're going, uh, based on the energy level before it. Now D block elements are as you can see often called transition metals and this is because they're between the highly reactive alkali and alkaline earth metals and the P block metals over here on the right. And they are so much less reactive than the S block metals that they are even occasionally found in nature as uh, lone elements such as gold or platinum or silver is also found in nature occasionally free. So now we'll look at the P block which makes up uh, groups 13 through 18 and first thing you have to know is that the P block every single element has a full S orbital so all of their S orbitals have two electrons in them already and this next thing you need to know is that the P block over here along with the S block, which we can also see on this uh, shortened table, form what are known as the main group elements. And the main group elements are the ones we're going to be studying for most of this course uh, with some dabbling into D block, but certainly not F block chemistry. 
Now an important number to know for all elements on the table, but especially for the main group elements that we're going to be working with, is the number of valence electrons that each element has. And the valence electrons are simply the ones in the outermost energy level. And it's really simple for the p-block elements. You just take the group number, in this case let's say for boron, aluminum, gallium, and indium, uh, 13, and then you subtract 10 and what you end up with is three, the correct number of valence electrons, because as you can see, they fill up the uh, 2s orbital, and then there's one electron in the 2p orbital, because this uh, p block over here follows the arrangement of uh, ns2, np, however many in this case, NP1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6, when you get all the way over to the noble gases. And this rule of subtracting 10 from the group number works for all the elements in the p-block. For example, if you were to take carbon and do 14 minus 10, you would get that it has four valence electrons, which is the correct number. And then, as you can see from this chart and the various colors, uh, the P block is probably the most diverse block on the table as far as uh, categorizing the actual elements within it. It contains metals, metalloids, and nonmetals. Now I'm sure most of you understand uh, some of the properties of metals, conductivity, luster, etc. And probably some of nonmetals as well, uh, such as oxygen and nitrogen that you breathe in and the carbon in the tip of your pencil. However, you may not understand this group right here, the metalloids. Now metalloids are what, is no, what are known as semiconductors, meaning they have conductivity that's between uh, the conductivity of metals, which is very good, and the conductivity of nonmetals, which is very poor. And continuing with the theme of diversity in the p-block, uh, it contains in group 17 a group that are known as the halogens, and the halogens are the most reactive nonmetals because if we follow our group rule 17 minus 10 we can see that they have seven electrons in their outer shell and this is one short of the octet rule which is what the noble gases next to them have which makes them extremely stable now this closeness to stability makes them extremely susceptible to chemical reactions in order to obtain this uh, eight electron oct octet, which is why the halogens are so reactive. And lastly, we'll just briefly cover the F block, which are the lanthanides and actinides. Now these are stuck sort of off the bottom of the table in order to save space and make sure it wasn't you know, massive side to side. And the lanthanides are between, the lanthanides and actinides both start between groups three and four, so right about here and they are used to fill up the F orbital which can hold which has seven suborbitals each holding two electrons each so there are 14 in total ways of arranging and therefore 14 elements in the sixth and seventh periods within the F block. Now the lanthanides and actinides are very similar to each other, so they were very uh, tedious to sort out. And then the actinides, which are the bottom row right here, are all radioactive, and then all of them after element 93, neptunium, were all made in a lab somewhere, meaning they're all synthetic elements. So they're not naturally occurring in nature. People had to use big particle accelerators and bombard uh, other elements with nuclei in order to form them, which is something we'll study later.